Most people know Nicholas Kristof from his Pulitzer Prize winning journalism and columns in the New York Times. But long before that, he was an American kid growing up in Yamhill, Oregon, at the tail end of the baby boom. And while his work has taken him around the world, his most recent book tells a crushing tale of what's happened to the working class in his hometown and across America. The book is called Tightrope, Americans Reaching for Hope. It's co-written with his wife, Cheryl Wu Dunn, and it brings Nicholas Kristof to our airwaves tonight from New York. It's so good to meet you, and thank you for sparing the time for us. Nicholas, how are you doing? Pretty well. Delighted to be with you. Thank you. I have to tell you that I found um, some of the most astonishing information in your book, literally in the first few pages, talking about growing up in Yam Hill. And most of the people, I shouldn't say most, some of the people that you went to school with all those years ago are dead. They are dead from homelessness, from drug addiction, from mental health challenges, from obesity. You went to Harvard. You went to Oxford. You're at the New York Times. How did this happen? Well, I mean, I grew up in a home surrounded by books. I was um, hugged. Uh, I was loved. It was expected that I would graduate from high school and go on to college. And a lot of my friends grew up in very dysfunctional homes with no books, um, with parents who were drunk every night, who uh, dads who beat up their moms every night. And, you know, Steve, the metrics of child poverty we use normally involve income or wealth. But maybe the most important metric is how often you're read to as a child or how often you're hugged. And by those measures, I just overflowed with opportunity and, and, and good fortune. And my friends did not. How heartbreaking has it been for you to know uh, what has happened to the people that you grew up with or some of the people you grew up with? Uh, well, conversely, you've had great fortune and done wonderful things in this world. It's hard. And there is some survivor's guilt, I guess. You know, I, I as a journalist, I was going around the world covering humanitarian crises. And then I'd come home to Yamhill, where my mom is still on a family farm, and I'd see old friends, and I just saw such um, such heartbreak. A quarter of the kids on my old number six school bus are now dead from these deaths of despair, drugs, alcohol, and, and suicide. And, you know, one of the things that really got to me was that I've, I've written a lot about sexual violence, and I know deeply, you know, how how horrific that can be on the on uh, on the victims on the survivors and there were two boys on my number 6 bus who were later convicted of raping young girls uh, one of them was a good friend of mine and trying to understand how that happens two boys on the same small bus and what that says about the social fabric of a community that I was very proud of a, a community where we we really thought our our social capital was enormous. Our social fabric was strong. And and to see this kind of disintegration uh, has truly been heartbreaking. Hmm. How concerned were you that readers might be so fixated on uh, sort of the, um, well, the more harrowing aspects of the story that you are trying to tell that they may lose, you know, they may lose, uh, with a clear exception of the person you just mentioned, the two people you just mentioned, they may lose the story of the fundamental decency that, that really does also emerge in your story. How worried were you about that? I, I was worried that we would end up kind of feeding prejudice and bias, biases rather than removing them. And for example, one of the people that um, is prominent throughout Tightrope is uh, my friend Clayton Green. And Clayton, you know, he's he was 400 pounds. He has a big beard. We have a number of photos of them. He cooked meth for a while. And I worried that people would see these pictures, hear his story, and just say, oh, you see, it's all about bad choices, about irresponsibility. And I wanted to convey that Clayton is smart and capable, a deeply loyal friend, every bit as talented as his dad who had lived uh, lived the American dream. But I didn't want to pull punches. And, you know, Clayton and I talked about whether it would be OK to to say that he had uh, cooked and sold meth and he had reservations. And I said, this is part of part of your story, who you are. And um, he trusted me. 
to tell that part of him. And, you know, I wanted to tell that fully rounded uh, story uh, in all its complexity. And I hope that came what came through to readers was indeed something that would tend to shatter their presuppositions and break prejudices rather than confirm them. Well, it surely came through to this reader. Uh, let's talk about health care for a second, because this is something that we Canadians feel, I think, rather um, smug and superior about. There's not much in this world, maybe health care and hockey, that we feel <laughs> smug and, and uh, superior about, but that's surely one of them. Uh, let me steal this from a recent column that you wrote for the NYT. The United States ranks number one in the world in quality of universities, but number 91 in access to quality basic education. The U.S. leads the world in medical technology, yet we are number 97 in access to quality health care. So much of the negative stories that you tell in your book uh, stem from the fact that you guys don't have... Um, you know, too many Americans don't have access to the health care that they need. Let's put it that way. How can a country which is so accomplished in some aspects be apparently so disinterested in others? So I think that it goes back to the 1970s. And I think, um, you know, at that time, um, the U.S. was about average in the, among advanced countries in terms of health metrics. Uh, Canada itself was then uh, just kind of beginning at the provincial level to work its way toward uh, national health care. And then other countries uh, surpassed us in educational investment, in, in health care, in building uh, social support mechanisms. And meanwhile, the U.S. developed two narratives that I think were extraordinarily unhelpful. And one was that government can't do anything right. And the other is that it's all about personal responsibility. And when people struggle, it's about their bad choices and they should be blamed for their struggles. And other countries, Canada included, did not have those narratives. And I think that made them more likely to reach out and help people, whereas it made the U.S. less likely to do so in ways that hurt not only those individuals, but our country as a whole. Let me do a follow-up on that, because, uh, you know, we haven't got a perfect health care system here by any stretch, but nobody loses their house because they can't afford to pay for an operation here. You have a line by Walter Cronkite, the great anchor in your book, which I think is terrific. Uh, the American health care system is neither healthy nor caring nor a system. Um, Explain to Canadians who may not understand, because we don't have this here, how health care and lack of access to it can be a leading cause of bankruptcy and therefore, you know, complete humiliation and the end of your life. Well, I mean, we have we in the U.S. have the worst of all possible worlds. We have uh, the most expensive health care in the world per capita, extremely expensive. And yet we don't have... Uh, broad access. And so if you're one of those millions of people who doesn't have uh, strong insurance coverage, then you um, then you're you're stuck with bills that are just completely unpayable. And that is, as you say, a leading cause of, of bankruptcy. And it's not just, you know, we often talk about medical insurance, but it's also dental. Um, about 30 million Americans don't have medical insurance. About 78 million don't have dental insurance. And for tightrope, we visited, I mean, I, I, I describe a man who had, was getting free dental care. He had 20 teeth being pulled uh, at, at once, you know, 20 teeth. How does that happen? Um, it's just, it's mind boggling. This should not be happening in an advanced country. And yet here the U.S. is with a, some of the best medical technology. And you have the situation, even kids in America, a child in America is 55% more likely to die by age 19 than a child in other OECD countries. That is a, that's not because that child is making poor choices. It's because we as a country in the U.S. are making poor choices. Hmm. Let's talk about the war on illegal drugs. And you, you do take us back to some conversations that happened among high-ranking people in the Nixon administration when the so-called war on drugs happened, which, uh, as it turns out, was not really um, much of a law enforcement thing. It turned into something a lot more cynical. You want to tell that story? Yeah. Um, so... There was this uh, debate at that point about 
uh, you know, about how to respond to drug use. And initially, the Nixon administration, for example, with Vietnam, uh, with soldiers in Vietnam, actually genuinely provided treatment. I used a, a public health approach rather than the law enforcement toolbox. But then it b began to see uh, law enforcement as a way to marginalize, uh, to, to, to basically to hurt the left and to uh, strike African Americans, to, to marginalize uh, much of America and have a political impact. And I must say that, you know, there were millions of Americans disturbed by what was happening with drugs in their communities, including in African American communities that bought into that. And I think that was maybe the, you know, one of the worst policy failures the U.S. has made to, to have the war on drugs, mass incarceration. Until the 1970s, the U.S. had the same incarceration rates roughly as Canada and other countries. Then we increased the number of people behind bars sevenfold. Um, that shattered family structure in the U.S. It meant that people became much less employable, much less marriageable. And... It obviously didn't work because now America is losing still 70,000 people a year from overdoses. It's, it'd be hard to find a policy that failed as badly for as long at such cost. What would a more enlightened approach to lowering drug abuse look like in your view? So in the 1990s, both Portugal and the U.S. were wrestling with a heroin problem. And the U.S. doubled down on the law enforcement approach and sent people, lock people up longer. Portugal, on the other hand, um, actually under Prime Minister Guterres, now the Secretary General of the United Nations, formed a commission and decriminalized uh, the drug possession, including of hard drugs like heroin and cocaine. There was a lot of debate about whether this would work. There was concern that it would increase the, uh, the, the use of drugs in Portugal. But now we have 20 years of experience. And in fact, what has happened in Portugal is that the number of uh, heroin users has uh, dropped by more than two thirds. And uh, Portugal now has the lowest uh, drug fatality rate in Western Europe. Um, it was a, an approach that worked while in the U.S., the number of drug deaths has soared, uh, as I said, 70,000 a year dying from overdoses alone. Hmm. Uh, we are less than two weeks away from your presidential and other elections, so uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to go there. Uh, we are going to have to talk about your president. And, and I guess one of the things that I want to explore is a lot of the people that you profile in your book, you know, the, the sort of poor working class of, of uh, middle America, if I can put it that way, uh, they like Donald Trump a lot. They think he has championed their causes. They think he has spoken to their humiliation in a way that the Democratic Party, which purported to do that, hasn't been able to do it and, in fact, has in many respects lost touch with that part of America. At least they certainly think so. Um, again, how did that happen? Well, Steve... So one of the people we talk about in Tightrope is my old seventh grade crush, Mary Mayer. And Mary is smart and talented, but partly because jobs were collapsing in the area. She spent seven years uh, homeless, wrestling with addiction, and then a church uh, helped her out. She, four people in her family committed suicide. At one point, she held a gun to her head. She understands as well as anybody the 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 crushing problems uh, in working class America. And I asked her at one point, did you ever think there was a political answer to these problems? And she said, well, traditionally she never had, but then in 2016 she did, and she voted for the first time in her life for Donald Trump. And I think that, you know, there were a lot of people who, like Mary, were desperate and they didn't know what to believe. And then along comes a and I think they also thought that a lot of Democrats condescended to them and spoke down to them and, and disrespected their faith, which in many cases was very important to them. And then Donald Trump came along and he said uh, that he was going to bring back manufacturing jobs. And he provided scapegoats in the form of immigrants and said he was going to fix that problem. And they weren't entirely sure whether to believe it, but it sure sounded better than what was happening right now. And so Mary and a lot of others voted for him. Um, and then, from my point of view, 
he betrayed them with his policies and, of course, with his uh, COVID response or, or lack of response. I know you say that, but, but most of them are still with him. So somehow he has managed to maintain their trust in spite of all of the empirically provable evidence that he's been a disgrace in so many other ways. How do you explain that? Well, so whenever I go back to Yamhill, um, and I follow a lot of my Yamhill friends on Facebook, you know, a lot of these folks live in an ecosystem, a uh, Facebook ecosystem, where all your news and information is kind of skewed and reinforces um, some really bizarre beliefs. Um, and actually, that's something that I, I kind of worry about, the disintegration of these of these communities. Uh, there's a lot of talk in Yamhill conservative circles, for example, about how Antifa is uh, waging revolution and 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 starting forest fires. Uh, I my last visit back, I uh, I visited a nearby forest and somebody thought that I was an Antifa arsonist and called the sheriff. And um, so I you know I think that a lot of people live in a bubble where they don't get accurate news. I think that. Also, it has been unhelpful when some liberals have accused every Trump voter of being a racist and a bigot. And I think that has made people defensive. It's pretty hard to win votes from people you're accusing of racism and bigotry. Do any of your uh, you know, former friends from Oregon, do they ever look at you and say, Nick, what are you doing working for that fake news operation? Come on, what, ha what happened to you? You know, it's, it's kind of funny because I, you know, I have these very dear friends and we completely love each other, and and yet, um, y you know, they they will post things about the mainstream news organizations all lying and deceiving people, and you know, being communist. And uh, then, you know, I will tease them about it, and they will tease me about it, and we we kind of you know agree to disagree on some of these subjects. They they certainly don't think that. I'm an evil person, but I think that they think that I've been gravely misled, and I think the same of them. Hmm. Let's talk about globalization here, because it, it is a fact that globalization has, uh, over the last 20 or 30 years, created incredible wealth around the world and in North America, particularly among the billionaire class. Uh, your book has some interesting prescriptions for how we can how we could massage that in order to, and, and of course the, the uh, concomitant consequences have been to essentially destroy much of the working class that you write so eloquently about in your book. What are some prescriptions that you could offer that, that if it is a Biden administration that comes in in January, that they could do differently to ensure that this working class of people has a better shot at the future, unlike the last 20 years that they've experienced of their lives? Well, I mean, frankly, I think there's an awful lot we can learn from Canada. We in the United States can learn from Canada uh, and from Europe, for that matter. You know, the tool there are toolboxes that are shown to work. We have toolboxes. We have resources in the U.S. What we don't have is the political will. And so I advocate, you know, things like child allowances that Canada has done, more emphasis on job retraining uh, that Canada has done, uh, more em emphasis on, on drug treatment, uh, which Canada has also uh, done better than the U.S. at. Uh, one of the things that I think left a quite deep impression on me was we we looked in tightrope at what had happened to auto workers who were unemployed both in Detroit and in Windsor uh, in the aftermath of the of the of the Great Recession. And in the U.S., the policy response was uh, to extend unemployment compensation. Essentially, the U.S. response was an income stream. On Ontario, the response was much more about job retraining. And essentially that worked an awful lot better. And one of the things that I learned from Tightrope is that, you know, a job is so much more than an income stream. It's a source of identity, a source of pride, a, a source of purpose and meaning. And when you lose that job, getting some kind of financial compensation is far from enough. I mean, that was one of the things that just really screamed out in the book was that was that the, the, the loss of a job and the lack of access to health care begins a spiral from which too many people can just never recover. And then you get into opioid addiction and then you get into drugs and then you get into mental health. So so somehow the next administration has got to focus better on those two things. Do you think they know that? I think that there is a debate 
about that. Um, now, my hope, and you know, in the middle of this crisis time, and we've been talking about a lot of grim things, but I really do have hope, and it's partly that uh, these problems that I we describe in Tide Group, I really think they're 50 years in the making, and it's it seems to me that the last few years have shown just how badly we have screwed up, just how badly our path has, has taken us in a wrong direction. And COVID has maybe amplified that. And in 1932, Americans uh, voted for Franklin Roosevelt and gave him a mandate and flipped the Senate in that year. And the result was the New Deal. And it wasn't because Franklin Roosevelt was some great revolutionary, it was because previous policies had failed so disastrously. I think that it is now more clear than it was a few years ago how badly American policies uh, have failed, that you know, lack of universal health care in a time of infectious disease has more obvious failings than at a time of chronic disease. And so I'm hoping that this will be a 1932 election and that a new president who is not revolutionary, Joe Biden, any more than Roosevelt was, will seize upon that mandate and, you know, steal some ideas from Canada, uh, like, um, uh, you know, better childcare and, and pre-K, uh, universal health care, um, child allowances. That The most important thing I'd like to see is investments in kids. It's At this point, there are a lot of 40 year olds or, or you know, my generation, it's, it's gonna be hard to help those people. We've got to help those kids who are on the number six bus today. Hmm. Well, I do have to say, and, and uh, we'll, we'll just touch on one more thing here in our last couple of minutes, which is uh, you do seem to like Canada a lot for an American journalist. You know a lot about us. You once wrote a column called Thank God for Canada, in which you wrote, Canada may be one of the world's most boring countries, as yawn-inspiring as sensible shoes. Wake up, reader. I know you're snoozing. But it's also emerging as a moral leader of the free world. You know, I, I do remember also the Washington Post running a contest on what the most boring headline of all time would be, and I think the answer was worthy Canadian initiative. Um, since we are too polite and boring to, uh, to heap praise on ourselves, you've done a great job of it during this interview, for which we're grateful. But, but we have a very different set of values and culture up here. I'm not saying better or worse, just different. That is a non-starter, it seems to me, in so much of your country. So I wonder whether or not you know, an importation of some of those Canadian values is on in the United States. What do you think? Well, you know, I would make a point that historically, I don't think Canadian values were so different. And, you know, I think in the 1940s and early 50s, Canada was a pretty xenophobic uh, place. It had, you know, uh, there was a white Canada uh, policy. and And yet somehow Canada... Um, found a way to change. You know, I think Pierre Trudeau energized some political capital to to start that process. And I think Canadian uh, Canada moved in a lot of really important directions on healthcare and 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 in in education and so on. And I think that the U.S. at the same time moved in some of the wrong directions. I'm hoping that we will learn from mistakes and begin to return to the kind of community of nations, not just Canada, but also Europe. Um, and that would be good for the US, it'd be good for the world. And in our last 20 seconds here, do I have this right? You used to live in Kitchener-Waterloo? I did. Uh, my uh, parents took uh, jobs briefly at the University of Waterloo, uh, but we moved there in the summer. And then when the winter came, my dad thought, oh, goodness, uh, you know, <laughs> and so uh, and so um, after a couple of years, the winters just got to them and we uh, that's when we went to Oregon. <laughs> no, I, I think we all get that. Uh, Nicholas, it's so good of you to spend so much time with us on TVO tonight. The name of the book is Tightrope. It is um, it's must reading if you want to understand what's going on in the United States today and uh, take good care. And thanks so much. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.